So I was, uh, good afternoon, I was asked to uh, give a, a, a kind of a, an update on some of the research that we've been doing on cover crops over the years. Let me get this to the slide show here. And so we've been, it turns out I've been working on cover crops for about 20 years. Kind of accidental, not how I got into them, but uh, anyways, they've been interesting enough for me to stick with over the long term. Uh, good. So this is actually a picture uh, in the foreground of what cover crops look like in Montana. This is actually termination day um, at one of our sites in Amsterdam, Montana. Uh, before I get too far though, I want to acknowledge some colleagues uh, involved with this, um, with this research. Uh, Clayne Jones has been doing some soil fertility aspects, recovering soil fertility aspects of this research, and, and uh, Kathy Zabinski is a rising sphere ecologist, and so she really does a good job of, of guiding us through the biology. Uh, Jeff Holmes is uh, a very capable technician and has been about four graduate students who have been at various parts of their theses involved in, in this work also. So, but first I'm supposed to put a map up there, so here it is. This is a map of the Northern Great Plains as uh, conceived by Glenn Padbury in an in a, in a agronomy journal article in 1996. Actually, I think that's wrong. I think it's 2002 that did that. And so here's Montana, right? This is not the Pacific Ocean. Here's the Canadian border, just to give you an idea of where, where we're situated. Uh, here's a close-up of, of Montana. This is this blue star down at the bottom is Bozeman. And uh, I've got a couple of studies going there, both in the longer term. Uh, here is an on-farm site that we've got going at, uh, at Conrad, Montana. We've got another on-farm site going to Big Sandy, Montana. And then what you need to know about this map is anything you see in brown is your wheat fallow areas. So fallow is very predominant in those areas where you, where you see brown. That's, that's under 12 inches of moisture of annual precipitation in those brown areas. And then here is Kent Wasson's farm up here north of Malta, and he'll be uh, following my presentation. So now that you're oriented, uh, this is not cover crop biomass in one of my farms. This would be from central North Dakota. Uh, this is actually termination day on the very first year, very first site that we ever did cover crops. And, and sorry, with the mixed uh, the mixed polycultures. Uh, we've got some, some things that we focused on leggings over a much longer time period that I'll show you here momentarily. But you get a sense, it's quite a contrast, right, the amount of biomass that we're producing. This is 60 days worth of biomass. Um, you know, it was a, a drier than average year, but even so, we tend to not do uh, huge biomass. Okay, so first I should tell you what my angle is on cover crops, uh, how, you know, how I came to this. I'm a no-till researcher, uh, and I focus on, I'm interested in water, water use efficiency, and no-till brings more water into play. And pulse crops have been very important uh, complements to wheat production in our zone, uh, partly because they're very water use efficient crops themselves. And so this is what pulse crop production has done in Montana. Uh, from two, 1994 to 2017, these are in thousands of acres, so uh, over a million and a half acres uh, this past year in pulse crops. So, you know, there is some, some diversification uh, going on, but I've got an area circled here in blue that was about the time I started at Montana State, and there was a five-year drought. And that was not a very fun time to be trying to do uh, more intensive cover or more intensive crop diversification research because everything we were trying was not working very well, and so uh, I thought, well, maybe if, if we really don't have enough water, it's too dry to crop continuously, and by continuously I mean annually uh, in Montana. Maybe we should look at trying to green up the fallow period, and so you know, points there. Annual cropping is risky or too risky in some places and sometimes at least. And could we grow a crop, a cover crop during the summer balance, do some good for the soil and not use up too much soil water? Soil water is everything uh, in, the, in the northern plains. Um, and could forage harvest improve economics? And Kent Lawson will be talking about that here momentarily. Well, here's the first study that I did. And this is, I'll just walk you through this, it's not that complicated a slide. This is crop available water on the left, some millimeters, that's the units don't really matter. Uh, three crops on the bottom, wheat, pea, and fallow. What we did with the wheat is we actually harvested it for grain and removed the straw on some of the treatments. Peas, we did the same thing, harvested for grain, removed some straw, and then we actually terminated peas early after about 60 days of growth. Some we hate off and some we just sprayed out. I, I've got a list of the green manure here, but really should say brown manure because we, you know, we sprayed it out and left it 
and a no-till system on the surface. And here's the chem phthalate control. This is showing crop available water the next spring. So we grew these cover crops in 1999, and then now we're measuring, we're about to plant spring wheat. And I want to know what the soil water is. And so this is what the soil water looked like the day we're, well, not quite the day, but a, a few days before we're going to plant spring wheat. Quite a difference. So that was, it was interesting. We conserved some water with that 60-day termination of peas in, in those cover crop treatments. And there is the wheat yield. Again, the units don't matter a whole bunch. This is in kilograms per hectare over here. It's roughly the same as pounds per acre. Uh, and same treatments. And look at the kind of yields that we were getting. And, and this was 1999-2000, very dry year. That was the start of that five-year drought. And we had a yield that, uh, on our hay peas uh, that wasn't significantly lower than Kemp Valley. That was a bit of an aha moment for me. I thought, wow, maybe, you know, if we don't have enough rain to actually crop continuously or crop annually in this region, maybe we could do something to produce a little bit of, of, of biomass, feed the soil a little bit, and not use up too much soil water. And so, we hit a bullseye the first time, and then we had miss after miss after miss. Probably another 15 trials where we looked at using uh, cover crops on a short-term basis and saw very substantial crop yield loss following most of those trials. And so that was, that was discouraging. You know, why did we get it right once and then and it just miss so often after that? Uh, and so that was short term, right? Those are two year cropping sequence. You know, we know it takes a long time to build soil or change soil, but we know it really takes a long time in dry, semi arid regions like Montana. So I was more interested in looking at it from the long term uh, because we just know that it, it, it takes time for soils to change. This is, I'm going to show you some data, for, just a little bit of data from this study of Bozeman. It happens to be a picture from July of 2013. This was started in 2002. Uh, uh, at that time, I, I was interested in peas. I thought they might be an important crop for Montana. You know, so we put in some, some pea to grain treatments, but we also put in a couple of pea cover crop treatments. One that we harvested for hay every year, and one that we just sprayed out as a, as a brown manure. We also had both tilled and chem fallow controls in there, which are pretty important controls for Montana. And this is important to remember, a 16-inch precipitation zone in Bozeman. Uh, so I'm just going to show you two data slides. Uh, the, I'm not going to really take the time to explain this because it's the pattern that, that matters here. Uh, this is a measure of wheat nitrogen uptake comparing uh, one of our pea cover crops versus chem fallow. And what you need to know is that if it was above this red line, it was taking out more nitrogen following the cover crop than it was from chem fallow. This was first cycle, second cycle. By the third cycle, we were taking up significantly more nitrogen from that pea cover crop. Uh, so it took a while for that soil to change, right? Three cycles. By the fourth cycle, it was even better. Uh, and that was despite taking a 36 pound per acre nitrogen credit. So we backed off on fertilizer following the pulse crops by 36 pounds and still saw higher nitrogen uptake. So that was pretty encouraging. And there's a long term story there with just you know, a, a legging cover crop that looked, looked like it was pretty exciting. And we did a we did a full economic workout on this. I've got a colleague, you know, Anton Beckerman, that helped uh, with, you know, provide some real economics uh, with this study. Uh, here is my till fallow and no till fallow systems. Here's my two peat cover systems over here on the far right. And we had two different nitrogen fertilizer uh, regimes, a, a full rate and a half rate. And then we also, with Anton's help, uh, it, it turns out that protein discounts are a pretty big deal in wheat production in Montana. It's, it, it's, it's a bit unique to Montana. The kind of discounts that our growers can, can endure are, are pretty substantial in some years. Some years they can be very steep discounts. Some years if there's lots of protein around, uh, it's, it's not such a, it can be a, more of a flat discount. And Anton actually had grain, grain elevator data from 42 elevators over 12 years which let them generate two equations, one for steep discounts and one for flat discounts. So we're able to run these systems through these four scenarios. And you look at the spread, over here on the y-axis is actually summed returns in dollars per acre, so that you'd have to divide it over a four-year period, sorry. So you'd have to divide that by four to get to sort of a per-year basis. And we did this in years seven through 10 of this study. And we reasoned that it maybe, you know, maybe it took six years to get the systems functioning, something to what you know what they should be behaving like, and so we wanted to look at these systems once they were uh, kind of in full flight, so to speak. And there's there is you know the spread that you got with the different scenarios with my two fallow wheat systems. And there, did 
work. And they look at how close or how narrow the response is amongst those different pulse, uh, especially the peak cover systems. You know, Peter Grain was actually our biggest economic uh, winner, but even the peak cover systems, our returns are about the same as, as crop fallow. Presumably we've done something with uh, positive for soils, and the economics look like it's a really a nice, resilient system. I mean, um, the legumes themselves did a great job of, of backstopping the nitrogen needs either for yield or protein um, in a way that was economically important. Well, that was a 16-inch rainfall zone. This is a 12-inch. Same study, or similar study. Uh, some, we took some of the same systems and ran them. A big sandy, 12-inch precipitation zone. Here is my pulse wheat system. Uh, this is economics now over the first six years. So I haven't done any equilibration period. You know, I just sort of jumped in and said, okay, how are these things working right off the bat? Average, uh, uh, or some of the returns uh, over the first six years. Uh, my pulse wheat system you know, is still the economic winner. But here's my pea brown manure in the blue circle. I mean, I, I, it, here is the chem fallow system. You know, certainly this cover crop is, is economically much worse off um, during these first six years than, than we are with that chem fallow system. Uh, so that's, you know, that's going to be a challenge. I think these drier areas are just going to be a challenge. So the first time I heard about cover crop mixes was actually from Jill Clapperton. I heard her name mentioned earlier today. And uh, I went up and saw her plots at Lethbridge in early, the early 2000s. And uh, quite frankly, it wasn't that impressive. I mean, there, it was a nice idea, but there wasn't much biomass. But it was the first time I'd heard about it. Uh, the next time I heard about it was from a farmer in our valley, uh, Carl Vandermolen. He wanted to do some work uh, to look at cover crop mixtures. He heard about them and wanted, wanted us to do some work. And so we did. We applied for some funding from SARE, got funded, and, and away we went. Um, and we, but we decided to ask fundamental questions. There's just no data in our region that applies to us. And so you know, let's back up and say, what can these crops do? And so we wanted to know what a, a, what a polyculture could do that a sole cover crop species could, couldn't. For us, that was going to be a legume. That was our peak cover control. We had some idea that we were trading water for nitrogen with a legume. We kind of understood that. But what did the, what did the polycultures do? And so uh, we wanted we would ask the question about different plant functional groups, how they affect soil properties differently. We've got a suite of biological, chemical, and physical soil attributes. And we had you know, three years of funding from SARE to get started. We stretched that to four. And then, uh, but we realized we really needed to do a long-term assessment on this. But there wasn't that much that was exciting to look at after, after two cycles. Um, just quickly, here's what the study looked like. Uh, so we've got four functional groups. We did. We put a lot of thought into the species and the functional groups that we went with. But we've got nitrogen fixers, you know, carbon contributors with fibrous rooted crops, uh, tap roots, and we wanted to look specifically at brassicas because of their biochemical nature. And we've got some redundancy in each group just in case we had some crop failure that we wouldn't. Uh, that we would still have the species present, but we had actually pretty good establishment in the world. And the, the actual treatment structure is a chem fallow is a control, P is a control, we've got the full mix, which is all eight species amongst those four functional groups. And then each functional group by itself, nitrogen fixtures, fibrous roots, tap roots, and then the full mix minus each of those functional groups. This is actually what one of the studies, uh, sorry, one of the, I'll get to that in a second. This is what one of the studies looks like about two weeks after termination. Uh, the, the crops are all brown because they've sprayed, been sprayed with glyphosate and they're drying down. Except you'll note these dark green squares in there. I wonder if anybody knows what that is. Those are, those, Doug, do you know? It's, it's my pea plots. Uh, it turns out legumes are somewhat resistant to their tolerant to glyphosate, so it's not always got a great kill with, with the legumes. It's taken a lot longer than get those burned down. Pardon me? <laughs> yeah, I, I, me too. Uh, so the so question we're asking is anything separating from the herd, right? And so we kind of expected, the, you know, we knew legumes, we expected them to separate from the herd. I'm going to show you some preliminary data. We've had to sort of uh, move this to a skeleton operation to try and keep it going in the long term, uh, if, if we've got very little funding to keep it going. Um, but here is the three, the big three we call them. This is fallow, chem fallow on the left, the sole pea and the full mix. Uh, then I've got Nebraska versus minus Nebraska. Each of the functional group minus their mixture that, that excludes or excludes that, that functional group. So these are kind of pairwise comparisons. Uh, this is available soil water measured at termination. So we've terminated these things in early July. Now we just go in and immediately measure what soil water looks like, and you see, you know, here's the fallow versus everything else. So I mean, it, it's real. 
it, 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 in this particular site, it's one and a half to four inches of greater water uh, under that Kim Fallow situation. It usually averages two to three across these, these studies is, is, is the kind of water cost that we get. And, and less nitrogen also. So, I mean, that's a positive depending on some areas. It's not such a positive for us. Um, I just got a couple things highlighted. Here's that pea cover crop. So it's got significantly greater nitrogen than, than the full mix. And then here is the end fix versus the minus end fix. Boy, you have a special light touch on this. Um, so, so, you know, the, the legumes are doing what we expected them to do. Um, here's the wheat yield from last year. And what I just want to do, you know, we've got uh, at the Conrad site, which is, which is a, a drier site, actually just has a different rainfall pattern mainly. Uh, we had a pretty substantial yield cost with any of our coverage. That's the brown bars there. It's, I'm going to take a chance here. This is fallow on the left, and then all of those other bars are various cover crop treatments, and they're all significantly less than that camp fallow, meaning the wheat yield were less. Amsterdam, not so much. You know, we do, we get a, we do get a different uh, kind of winter-centric precipitation pattern at Amsterdam that lets us recharge soils in a way that we don't do up in the north central area of the state. Um, but, there we go. We've got a brassica story emerging for the first time. In both sites, the brassica functional group versus the minus brassica functional group had higher winter wheat yields than, you know, than the minus brassica treatment at both locations. So if it happened at one location, I would say, ah, you know, in both locations, something, something interesting going on there. That's the first time we've had any functional group other than legumes kind of separate out from the herd. Um, and we'd, we'd like to know, we've got some ideas why this might be happening, but we'd like to actually some research to find out what it, what it is. Uh, so just uh, in finishing here, I, I want to know what Montana farmers, or I'll show you what Montana farmers are doing with cover crops. Uh, this is some actual data from the, the Montana uh, Division of the National Ag Statistics Service. Acres on the times a thousand on the, on the y-axis in the years 2014 through 2017. Uh, in each of those bars, the blue bit is our cropping practices that are identified as either left standing or uh, green manure cover or, or actually says cover crop. So that's, I would class that as the cover crops that are planted and just sprayed and left uh, on the soil surface. 2017 is a bit of a jump and I think that's only because there was a new category added in the, in the spreadsheet that actually stated cover crops. And so it seemed like that, that jumped up a little bit, but I think that some of those cover crops were probably being lost in these other categories in previous years. The important thing, though, is the brown bit is cover crops that were hayed or harvested for silage. The green bit is, are the cover crops that were grazed. And so pretty obvious that farmers are voting to include animals, right, with their system. Um, and so I think we need to be cognizant of that as we proceed with our research. Uh, we are, I have had uh, a very short-term look at grazing effects on soil parameters. And what I would say is in the short term, you know, Two-year studies grazed this year. Look at what happens to the, to the soil, and then what happens to the next wheat crop. Uh, we are seeing where we get differentiation between chem fallow and the cover crop treatments. We're not seeing as big a movement following the grazed treatments in a few of the parameters. So, it suggests to me that you know, by removing that biomass of an animal, uh, we have slowed down that soil change. There is a long-term study up at MSU Northern Ag Research Center uh, near Haver that I, I want to acknowledge because they do have. Uh, a study that was began in 2012, I believe, that is getting some legs under it, and it's going to get a chance to look at different termination uh, strategies, grazing versus haying versus uh, just spraying out. But Darren Boss and Maurice Bourbeau are, are running that study, and uh, so we should be getting some data from, from that study um, soon. But I want to say what really matters is, guys, you know, I, I've, I've showed you what our research is showing, but I think it matters what guys like Ken think. And so, I don't think we're going to have a discussion right now, but I think we're going to turn it over to Kent.